Choreograph Live. I am Perry. I am here with a bunch of people to talk about how we're dealing with the pandemic. And um, I invited people I, that have different perspectives coming at this because, my God, I mean, talk about seeing the world through your little lens. We're all like kind of stuck, right? We're all stopped in our tracks. And um, so the folks I invited, Ruth, Ryan, and Andrew, are um, all, they all have different perspectives. And Andrew, I want to tell you that you have paper over your camera. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> I'm That's sorry. <laughs> I mean, it was like the equivalent of like a bag, on, like a grocery bag on your head. It just would have been weird. Right. I wanted to tell you. I'm really hot. Really, I am. <laughs> well, let me introduce you first. Hi, Andrew Fernside. Hello. Um, Andrew is a uh, mental health counselor and um, also an artist and a muralist. And I invited him to talk um, today from both those perspectives, from being like a creative person involved in the creative community here in Albuquerque and elsewhere, and also um, having some insight into the mental health aspect of all this, because man, it's a trip, all of this on everybody. Yeah. So thank you for coming and talking in, thank you in advance for coming to talk about that. Thank you, sure, yeah, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I'll also introduce Ryan Goodman, who's a sociologist and a professor at University of New Mexico. Correct. And we were talking earlier about how you're like, you know, in the middle of a semester trying to teach some sociology classes. And so now you're doing all that online, I would guess. We are trying to, yes. Uh, we have gone to, uh, in order to do everything online, and so those of us who have never done that before are uh, attempting to learn a brand new way to teach uh, in a very short period of time to try to get all these folks out the door in May. So uh, doing that, trying to not lose our minds in the process, trying to still make music remotely uh, with people, and uh, that's it's also another trip. But uh, Ryan yeah, is also lots, lots a drummer. Things. Yes, I am indeed. Um, cool. Well, I am looking forward to talking to you about the kind of sociological impact. And um, you were you were posting some interesting thoughts online, and um, and sometimes I think some of these like social institutions um, we don't think of them as such, but they're being impacted. And you're the type of person who can probably shine some light on that. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, we can uh, we can pull back the lens a little bit from our from our homes and try to see some of the bigger dynamics that are at play here. Yeah, right. Cool. And Ruth Dove um, from Coffee and Creatives, a co-founder hey, hey. of that organization, and a linguist, which I think is really interesting. Welcome. Um, guilty as charged. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good. Um. Can we just start by just checking in? Is everybody doing okay? What's the, you know, quick, um, Ruth, how are you, like, hanging? Just well, down. Yeah, we've been hunkered down for, we're rounding, what, two or three weeks. I've lost count. Um, apparently, I live on Zoom now. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've gone without a Zoom meeting daily for the last week and a half. Uh, last night, we had uh, Zoom happy hour with some of our best friends, um, and I found that. I found that incredibly like fortifying. It was really nice to have like our four little couple group that usually hangs out in person, uh, in public, uh, causing a scene as we tend to. Um, but now we were doing that at home and it was incredibly um, helpful to my mental health for sure. Awesome. Uh, but overall, yeah, you know, I've got my kid, I've got my husband, my two cats don't know why I'm home all the time. Um, so they're kind of confused. But uh, overall, I feel like uh, Albuquerque has kind of led with the with the right foot, and uh, we're doing this for good reasons. So that right. that helps keep me happy too, because I am not a homebody, and uh, I'll be damned if I'd be doing this under any other circumstances, y'all. Right? Oh my right. god. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really either. Oh, well, I am. I I I'm both. I work at home, so I'm home a lot. But then I go out. You know, I I do both. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm actually getting used to like having people in, in the house all the time. I work here by myself all the time. I don't know how I'm going to get used to that, but yes. we're working on it. I'm yeah. trying. Nobody's dead yet, so we're good. <laughs> Ryan, I, I saw you. I was just thinking cattle prods. We just need to, you know. 
Right. I saw Ryan no was doing baking, so you you had some oh, really yes. pro looking baked goods. Ah, uh, well, Whoa. well, thank you. I uh, it's catharsis, so it's <laughs> you know it it forces you into a linear process, and so you don't have the opportunity mm. to kind of think extemporaneously. You just kind of have to go from direction one through direction whatever in the recipe, and that yeah. just kind of forces my scatter shot brain into a linear thing. So. Yeah, and that's I, healing somehow. That's that's a relief to do. It is uh, for someone who doesn't think in those terms typically. Uh, it sort of it calms some of the the tangents away a little bit and, for, and forces the focus. Which uh, yeah. you know when your when your brain just spirals, it's nice to kind of rein it in from time to time. So. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I think I think we'll find that um, all of us, you know, especially those of us like you who think in spirals or constellations or scatter shots. Mm -hmm. um, dropping into linear processes is a big way to manage uh, we're right. feeling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, for me, it's digital media. <laughs> and <all> the, <laughs> honestly, even though I failed to get the live stream with audio today, um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of other work has been done that's been successful, and I, I like to try to deal with anxiety by I don't know controlling what I can control, like work right. stuff. You know, as long as it doesn't get completely consuming and I want to be like a present human being and take walks and stuff. Sure. But walks yeah. are good. Yeah. Walks are good. Um, it's funny because I hang out on my porch a lot just, you know, to get fresh air. I also work from home a lot of the time. So it's like, I'll just step outside and just take a view. And it's like, usually I'm alone outside. And like, you'd think everybody in my neighborhood has turned into like, an exercise freak because like turns out true. everyone I know has dogs in this neighborhood um apparently they weren't taking their dogs or kids for a walk before mm -hmm. I don't know I don't know what it is about it's true there's a lot of walking we we're so contrarian right so it's like go outside get some exercise I was like ah whatever I'm gonna watch tv but now everyone's like I'll oh, stay home and everyone's like oh shit I need to stretch my legs y'all I'm gonna take my whole family right both cats <laughs> all the dogs and we're walking we're just gonna keep walking I've seen people around here that I I know live right? around here and I've never seen before in my life so yeah the walks are good yeah. Uh, yesterday I, I, I think my dogs are going walking. to lose a lot of weight so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hope so That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, Although I don't know about those I, big goods, though. I don't think those are for the. Uh, well, it's. Lot. I mean, normally I distribute those to other people, but now they're stuck in the house. So. It's funny. A lot of people talk about stress eating, and I I stress not eat. I don't know why, but I I don't I I, I lose my appetite. I yeah, just I, I kind yeah. of I lose my taste for for stuff. Yeah. For you know. I, I'm so, actively dropping weight, not on purpose right now. Like right. I, I haven't been home long enough in the last God knows how long to weigh myself regularly, but here I am at home. So I've been checking in kind of with the scale a little bit. Just to make sure, right. yeah, I'm not like, you know, stress eating. No, opposite. Turns out I was going out and having a great time with my friends. And now that I'm not doing that, well, right. Here we are. Well, I wanted, wow. I wanted to, um, to start by asking Andrew a couple things about anxiety, fear, how, how we deal and then like, you know, bridge that into the, you know, the group of us and what we know about how, how various, you know, how are those, how is wellness institutionalized in our country? How, how are we going to deal with stuff like this? Um, how can we help ourselves through culture and arts? Like I've been thinking about design, like looking around my house, I want to be looking at pretty things. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just like yeah. trying to find those ways, both small and more, more socially. Um, what are your thoughts and um, observations in this last week? I'll start with Andrew. Uh, with how people are dealing with the mental health aspects of this, because this an, it's an incredibly traumatic experience for a lot of people, some more than others. I mean, frankly, some I see that are underplaying or downplaying how serious it is. there are certain people who are downplaying the seriousness and they don't seem terribly stressed out or maybe they are i don't know maybe they're like you know mm. they're denying what's happening but but clearly something really big and pretty scary is happening globally right. and right. um what are your thoughts on on maybe ways okay. that we we can deal with that or your observations on how we are well man i got a lot to say that's a big topic. Um, it's all so big. It's, it's all very big. Right. 
Uh, and yet when we're experiencing anxiety, um, it, it, we're, we become more and more focused on ourselves. We, we tend to shut down, uh, you know, the more, the broader reach of our sensing and knowing and focus on just ourselves. So it's, I think honestly, it's, it's a very human way of dealing with something that's overwhelming, something that's too big is to, you know, turn off all the input aside from the, this one angst, the anxiety piece. Right. Um, well, a big thing about anxiety is that it, it deranges our ability to assess what is going on. Um, and somebody who suffers from like a, an anxiety disorder, you know, something clinical as opposed to just the symptoms of anxiety. Um, for that person, this, this goes on all the time. It's difficult to assess what is anxiety and what is an actual concern of something that could really happen. Uh, anxiety, a lot of us experience anxiety cognitively. Or we have thoughts that are anxious. And you can often tell them because they might be catastrophizing. Like, I feel kind of scared that I'm sitting on my porch and I'm having a Mai Tai and I'm a little scared that I put too much alcohol in my Mai Tai. And if I drink too much, I might run down the street, tear off my clothes, and get eaten by a wolf. Holy shit! You know, like, that's anxiety. It's right. The, it's the catastrophizing leap in our thinking from something that's a concern, like, I could drink too much alcohol right now, and that would probably be bad, to something that's really unreasonable. I'm going to tear off my clothes and run down the street getting eaten by a wolf. Right. Lots of people experience anxiety as a, as a disorder. It's a real common experience that it's difficult to trust one's thinking because we experience our anxiety in our cognitive world. Yeah. We also experience anxiety in our body. Um, for me, the big one is my heart. Like, mm. I can immediately tell, having listened for years and years now, like, oh, that's anxiety. Oh, And right. for some people, it's in their gut. They have stomach aches. You know, For some people, it's in their shoulders. That's and me. they don't really feel it here or there. That's me, it's like and, in and the back of my neck, and I start like getting like this. Yep. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm, gonna sit, so, I'm gonna I'm gonna breathe right now, and like let <laughs> yeah find that spot. <laughs> yeah. But that's <laughs> that's interesting bit. what you say about the shutting down. I just read an article yesterday about how it, this situation and, and anxiety in general can make yeah people just you, you get into this frozen, you kind of like, you kind of like no quick moves. You just want to like be still. It's an interesting thing. It's interesting that you use that word because I, I, that word is often a cue that we're in trauma land. That it's not just uh, I am by myself and it's this happy, beautiful, shining paradise, except I have like, you know, cognitive problems due to my anxiety, but frozen. That's one of the, it's, it's one of the three responses in a trauma response to what's going on. And this is why, like, this moment is so, um, well, it's overwhelming, another trauma world, a trauma word a lot of the time. Do you, what do you think about using, like, art and music and being creative to, like, try to unfreeze ourselves? And I ask that because, like, I have the, um, the uh, reaction when I'm anxious, like, I don't want to play guitar. I don't really want to play music. Um, I get, I do start to kind of, like, freeze up and... Um, I don't know. Should I force myself to like, should I force myself to play, to play and sing? No. Thank you. No, you should. <laughs> <laughs> this is the benefit of being a drummer because it's just a kinetic sort of release of energy. And so sure. I try to sit down every day and, and do that because it, it, you know, while it's creative, it's also a very, very physical activity for me. And it just sort of, I could see that it's all of really... the things out. Hmm. I'm gonna maybe I'll pick up drumming. <laughs> uh, We've got a little kid here, but yeah, yeah I mean, um, I was kind of joking when I said should I force myself, but you know sometimes you you look for ways like how can I break, how can I change the way that I'm feeling, it, yes, you know, in a healthy way without like you know getting blackout drunk or. <laughs> For instance, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I I worry about people, you know, and with substance abuse problems during this time. I mean, it's you know, yeah. what are the healthy ways? Cause yeah, because I think stuck at home with their own thoughts is not going to be good for most of us. 
Well, I think there's a, a thing with anxiety is um, if we treat anxiety like a, uh, a deranged four-year-old, then that's what we'll get from anxiety. We'll get tantrums and freakouts and it, it won't get better. If we treat our, if we can notice that we're having this catastrophizing thinking, we're leaping from something is wrong to like, obviously I'm gonna get killed by a wolf. Um, if, if that's a cue that I'm having anxiety, what I wanna do is listen to anxiety as if it actually has something important to say, which is there's something fucked up going on. Like that I really need to get. I don't need to go run down the street naked and get eaten by a wolf, but I do need to go, oh, like I'm anxious. There's probably a good reason. Right. So like we yeah. need to then what it, so we need to assess. We're going to try to take our brain out of the hindbrain stuff out of uh, falling back into trauma. And we'll try to do some actual cognitive thinking, force ourselves back to where we are in time and space. So, and then we're, we want to actually know what the problem is. This is why this pandemic is so fucked up. <laughs> the problem could be, I've been inside my house for three weeks and I've been sitting on this couch probably 12 hours out of each day. I think I'm going insane, Bleh, right? You know, <laughs> that's a real problem that can, actually there's a solution. We should yeah. probably go out on the porch or we should probably like take a walk with our dog or our cat or whatever. We need a, it's a rational solution. And anxiety was telling us that there actually is a problem that is a rational problem. Anxiety is really confusing. It, you know, it does uh, irrational and rational at the same time. It does, uh, I'm really anxious because I haven't moved a long time. Plus, I think I'm going to get killed by a wolf. Those are like the same, you know? Right. So we have, to, we have to get good at assessing what's going on. The problem with anxiety and the pandemic is one of the things that's going wrong is there's a disease which is killing thousands upon thousands of people in the real world now, actually happening. It's real. Right. I think we're totally used to, uh, I think we're used to a political world where we're used to disinformation now. We're used to like the news being Trump is an asshole again. Like, you know, we're used to <laughs> not paying attention um, or having it be bullshit. So I think all of us have been going through this moment of, oh, wait, this is actually real. My anxiety has a real source. Yeah. You know, like I'm, I'm not crazy. I, all of this derangement in my head is not crazy. It's coming from right. a real thing. Right. And then, yeah, and then when the size of that real thing, you know, comes into focus as well, it kind of creates more anxiety. Uh, right. You know, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, it's really out there. Oh, my. Right. Yeah. And um, like, that's actually to the good. We may not, we may, you and I, us four, may not have a solution like, I have the cure to COVID-19. We don't have that. Um, but we can actually realize that we're, we're essentially, uh, we're okay. To the good. We may not, we Sorry. Oh, wow. That was a <laughs> that technical freak out. Yeah. Are we not supposed to swear on, on your live stream? No, we can, we can, we can swear. Oh, thanks for <laughs> It'll be Fucking just like pandemic. my classroom then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fucking pandemic, yeah. Ryan, um, clue us in a little bit on the sociological side of things and like how a lot of these micro individual things that we're talking about. Um, you know, how, how, are, how are our social institutions being affected also? Yeah, um, I think first to, to kind of piggyback on some of the, the discussion on, on the kind of micro level stuff, um, a couple of the things that we do know uh, from, you know, some older theory, some more recent theory, uh, we know that we, particularly now, you know, generations upon generations of being social creatures, we require this. Uh, mm -hmm. We require interaction. We require networks and communities and the building of social bonds. Uh, going back to Emil Durkheim's work in the early 20th century on anime and social isolation, right? We, we start to break down when we lose those tethers to not just one another, but to, you know, social norms and culture and community and just, you know, uh, just going for a drive and seeing that there are other people out there. Right. If we don't do those things, we start to become normless. We start to become anomic. We start to become self-destructive. What does anomic um, mean? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's the it's the sense of being normless. 
right? That there is nothing tethering oh. you to right and wrong. There's nothing sort of guiding, you know, the angel and the devil aren't there anymore. And you're just right. sort of left to kind of figure it out. That's and wild. We're, not good at, we're not good at doing that on our own. We need Ooh, society's question. kind of influence on us to figure that out. Can I Go ask ahead. my question? Sure. Um, the angel and the devil. So uh, the norm that you're describing sounds very much about uh, moral functioning and ethical functioning. What are the other dimensions of this norm? Because I like I think it's bigger than than just yeah. That. I mean, it's you know a norm in 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 sociological way of thinking is any kind of expected version of behavior. So that could sure. be moral or ethical. That could be you know legal. That could be whatever. It's a sense of knowing the kind of socially accepted path that you should be taking in a given circumstance or in a given given right. setting. And so that may have moral and ethical implications but it may also just be you wait until the light's green to go. Sure. But the only sure. reason that that works is because I'm trusting that the people who have the red light are stopping. Yeah. And so that kind of social dynamic, even just driving, encourages us to think about one another and the, the trust that we're placing in each other, the trust that we're placing in the collective on that. Um, I think the other, the other kind of micro level thing I would note, um, some more recent ways of thinking about this is, in uh, kind of a society like ours, in this very hyper-modern, post-modern, post-capitalist kind of society, uh, we are very reliant on uh, what Anthony Giddens calls an abstract system, a thing that we don't understand, to provide most of what we need. So right. Uh, right. a great example yeah. of this is you walk into the house and you hit the light switch and the lights come on. Yeah, there is a lot behind that that none of us really have the expertise to understand. Right. A lot we of rely really on big, that big stuff. Yeah, big stuff, yeah. little stuff, really complicated, really simple stuff. But mm -hmm. things that, in mm -hmm. order for me to be a sociologist, I need someone else to be able to make sure the lights come on when I hit that switch. Because otherwise, right. I would have to spend all my time getting sources of light and heat and energy and whatever, like we did in pre-modern, you know, societies. And so yeah. when we start to feel those things break that's another reason when we start to break as individuals right so we rely on the supply chain at the grocery store because none of us are farmers uh, right. none of right. us manufacture toilet paper so we need the supply chain to work when that breaks down then we're left kind of in this again the sense not just of being untethered but being completely out of control right oh. i can't generate the food supply. It's not that I don't have the time or I don't, I just, right. I can't do that because of this right. system that's, that's out there around us. And so as those break down, we're kind of facing those same micro level dynamics. Um, Interesting. To kind of jump back out to the bigger, you know, the, the more macro picture, I think, um, you know, a couple things I would highlight at this point. One is, you know, the importance of effective institutions. We, they're one of those things you tend to not see when they work. Right. right? When they're functioning, they're invisible. You know, they're, they're kind of shaping our behaviors, they're shaping our day-to-day -day lives. And when they work fine, you know, everything, we, you know, we don't really see the healthcare system until we need the healthcare system. We don't see infrastructure until a bridge collapses. You know, we don't see the way that institutions work until they start to break. And when you have this kind of, I wouldn't say vacuum of leadership. There's leadership there. It's just sort of purposefully ineffective leadership at this point. Yes. When you have that, it's... That's a very kind way of putting it. Uh, yeah. I, I, tr yeah. I try to be diplomatic <laughs> where I can as an academic. Um, and unleash. It's so the, yeah, and, and so the... You know, while oftentimes we want to figure out, well, why the hell is he doing that? Where does this, you know, come from? For me as a sociologist, what I want to understand is sort of the impact that's having on the people who are reliant on those institutions, right? So if you're, you know, a healthcare worker in New York right now and you need 40,000 ventilators and the president is telling FEMA, no, they don't, well, then that's, that's an impact on those sort of downlink institutions that's really important to try to understand, right? So then what do they have to do? Well, they have to bid against another state to get ventilators from the supplier. Well, that's a broken system, right? It's not... Right. We, cannot, we often micro level and sort of individualize those decisions, but it's really just a system that was broken before. We just didn't know it was broken until it, the stresses put upon it broke it. Right. right. It wasn't just a bad person made a bad decision. We had a broken system. And this is just sort of highlighting the way that that process isn't working.
I think well. it's so interesting that sociology, as I was thinking about it before this meeting, it just, it's like these invisible systems. Like you say, it's so many, like when you think about, for instance, systems and art, like arts and cultural institutions, institutions we can think of museums and or you know nonprofits and but social institutions tend to be like you say like you don't think about them unless they start to break and it's unnerving and and the same with you know those cultural institutions right we're all everyone's sitting around streaming their favorite television shows well none of those shows are in production right now because mm -hmm. all of those people that are required on the crew to make those things happen can't work because they have to be within six feet of each other to work. So we're eventually going to run out of content at this point, <laughs> the way that this goes. So right? Gilligan's so, Island will be our <laughs> signal that the apocalypse we will, has we begun. Will, we will have to continue <laughs> to go back to the past. Yeah. Can I, can I share just a little bit of good news um, is that I got the audio working. So we actually are live now. Hello. Hey, Outstanding. everyone. I know. To, I, to anyone who stuck around. I was listening. There are a couple. I was listening, but also I had a I, I had it just a little like, couple light bulb moments. Anyway, I think it's fixed. So so I just wanted to reintroduce. Um, if I could just reintroduce everybody really quick, because we were having some audio problems a minute ago. But um, this is Paragraph Live, and I've invited smart people to join me <laughs> talk about Aww. what's going on. These two smart people. <laughs> Not it. <laughs> Shut up. Um, Ruth Dove is over to my left. Ryan Goodman is below her. Andrew Fernside is below me. And um, and we're talking about uh, psychological, social, cultural, and different kind of angles that each of us is coming from um, and how those things are being changed and being affected. Um, and how we as people are being affected by them during this intense period of dealing with the global pandemic. And Can I yeah. run a theory by Ryan? I, I, I have this, I try to make it brief. Yeah, shoot. Um, you know, we've got our conscious mind and all the stuff we're doing, typing and whatnot. Um, and we're surrounded by these institutions that do things like make light come on and provide us with food. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that we don't know how to actually make the food happen or make the energy you know, come along. We live, we're adapted to that. Right. But there's a part of us that is uh, always attuned to that. It is paying attention. We're not thinking that, but unconsciously, there's a part of us, which I would say is our gut brain, is always tuning in. So anytime we perceive a crack in an institution, and that, that, the way, the cracks that we perceive are totally subjective. If I think Trump is an idiot, then um, I perceive him as a crack in the system, you know? It's, it's at that point that we start to worry on an existential level, you know? Like the more cracks the mar there are, the more we are reminded of our uh, incredible dependence on this whole system that we're a part of. Um, and I think that, I, I figure that's, you know, it's like we're, there's a little piece of con uh, brain that we're conscious of, and then there's a whole lot of nervous system that's really attuned. So that's my theory. What uh, do you think? BS? Good stuff? Uh, well, no, just uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would think, um, you know, from, from my own uh, perspective and training as a sociologist, my focus would be less on you know, what, what the brain is doing there, which I think is, you know, certainly plausible, but more on, you know, it, whether it's that our, our unconscious or subconscious brain is attuned or whether it's, uh, you know, prior forms of socialization that are creeping in the back of our minds, or it's we're used to creating risk and creating anxiety out of things that weren't necessarily anxious, like you were talking about before. And so when the real ones show up, we first respond in the same way that we did with the fake ones, right? Or the fake ones, however you want to think about that. Um, sure. Yeah. And then uh, the more that those become real, then our, you know, our fight or flight may kick in a little bit higher, a little bit harder. Our individual tendencies that we've tried to, in some ways, socialize away, in some t some ways, encourage those kind of, you know, in increase. Right? We're seeing. Uh, panic buying of firearms and ammunition right now, right? That is a, that's a result of this kind of hyper individualized thinking of, you know. And toilet going paper. Back, yeah, going toilet back paper. to, you know, we're, we're reverting back to a time before we were social in a sense, right? Before society where all we did was we, you know, hoarded resources and protected invaders. 
well, that's what panic buying of guns is, right? That's thinking about someone's going to come and take my things. And so I need to protect myself from them because we feel like the institutions and the society that's been protecting us from that for generations is breaking. Right. And so we're, we're resorting to these things that look irrational. They're purely rational. They're just the wrong set of, you know, inputs to the decision making. In a sense. Well, okay. and, and yeah. if I could add to that, you know, the last, I don't know, five, 10 years, whatever, there's been, of course, this big effect with siloing and, um, the internet bringing us only the information that we, you know, that validates our own biases and, and assumptions and stuff like that. And just that, that term you use of a normative and, um, and I, I would imagine that different, different communities, for instance, people who are gun enthusiasts, you know, that's the most normal thing in the world to go and like stock up on guns at this point. Right. And so it's this compete, like I'm feeling this, this competition of these like siloed worlds now where we're kind of like so locked into our own you know, never before, I think, has society been so um, kind of insulated in, in these feedback loops of, of where we seek out information that validates things that we believe or want to believe. And um, I mean, what a, what a, how terrible it is really for an, uh, in, you know, an experience like this to further splinter people then, um, like when, when we're all cut off and then just like relying on our 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 own community norms, whether they be buying yeah. guns. Um, I don't know, I know a lot of people who are really active in like helping homeless people right now. I mean, there's like some things that I think sound a lot more positive, but anyway, yeah, I'm not really sure it, where my question is and all that other than to point it, out like the silo factor and normative behavior within these separated groups. And that we're, you know, we're in a moment where we've sort of been forced to be alone when what is necessary is a collective response. We all collective, right. we need to be thinking and acting as a community, but we can only do that as individuals right now. And that's a very kind of cognitively dissonant thing to think about, right? Yeah, I well, need to right. stay home and be by myself because that is a communal thing that we need for everyone right now, right? right? Uh, and, and we as a culture, are not designed to think communally right now. We, are, we have been sort of building and further, further into this kind of mass society where we're not really connected. We're sort of a right. bunch of individuals connected by citizenship. And that's really the only tie that binds. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you know, I think for myself, I do for myself, I provide for myself, right? And, and sure. the more alone we are now, the more that that feels real. And what we need is that big communal thing. And you can see that in the way that people try and get out of it. <laughs> right. So like in terms of language, um, you have all of these crazy like sort of gray areas that we're talking about now. It's like, yeah, go home. It's like, what does that mean? Oh, well, what's home, right? Like, can I walk to the end of my property? Can I go take a walk? Can I go to the gym? It's like, yes, yes, no. And it's like, okay, can I go hang out with my friends? It's like, mm, no, probably not. And so we keep having to clarify further and further just yeah using like words right be like this is okay this is not okay i think it's yours i don't know it's this the, your mic was like bouncing around i think it was like oh was it i think it was better? whoever right. it was i'll hold it over here then <laughs> um but really like we try to climb out of our responsibility at every turn um there was a really interesting post that i saw in regards to how we are talking about it and what are good words to use versus bad words to use, right? So less clear is practice social distancing. Uh, it's a new term, it's unclear, it's not specific, uh, it's conceptual versus something more clear, which would be stay at home, get groceries once a week. You know, that second term is literally just a set of directions for people, right? As opposed to the idea of practicing something that we're not yeah. even know is a thing. Or what, um, what is hoarding, you know, what's the definition? Some, right. Some things say buy 14 days worth for us, that's kind of hoarding to have a little a, bit, you know, but yeah, it's a language thing for sure. Yeah, it is. And we're constantly trying to get out of our responsibility because as Ryan mentioned, we are highly individualistic. We want to do whatever we want. We experience high levels of freedom to do so most of mm -hmm. the time. And so when we run up against a bug, it's like, oh, it's a bug, like whatever. Like, you know, let's talk about old parents right now. I love you guys. I love my parents, but I'll be damned if they're not doing exactly what they're not supposed to be doing right now. Right. And it's like, 
so frustrating to deal with. It's like, yes. you guys yeah. spent like the first half of my life protecting me. And here I am like, just mentioning a couple of things you could maybe avoid. And they're like, we're, we're not going to yep. do that. And it's yeah. like, oh my God, you guys, that's crazy. But again, it's because we're constantly trying to revert back to what we feel is like normal or whatever it is that, you know, feels good to us. Right. Um, and this whole idea of like being alone so we can be together later is really counter to that. And we have to be incredibly specific linguistically because people will do and say every single thing they can to get out of this uncomfortable feeling, yeah. this right. weird responsibility we have. Huh. That's, and that social distancing that so thing is interesting too, right? Because uh, in my field, we've been kind of encouraging people to not use that phrasing because that's actually the opposite of what we need. We need to be socially connected. We need to be physically distant. Right. We right. need to be, you know, we, we need to do what we're doing, right? We need to talk to each other and look at each other in the face from completely different homes where we're not anywhere near each other. But well, we, need the, we need the social connection. We just can't, we just can't see each other <laughs> physically, right? That's, <laughs> right? that's what we need. But, but I think, you know, some of where we're, you know, some of the problems that I'm foreseeing, you know, one is when you tell everyone to go home, as you were saying, that means different things to different people. That's also not safe for a lot of people. It's true. And, you know, we're forcing a lot of folks into environments that may place them in positions of vulnerability, uh, you know, whether that's right. their physical safety, their food, their shelter, whatever it is. Yes. You know, I think people yeah. are going to realize just how important public schools are once they're all closed. And the kids oh, are they're all closed now. Everywhere. Can I just throw something <laughs> so, in? Can I? Yeah. I want to throw, um, while I can, while you just said that, um, I think it's just really important to keep getting the messaging out. I've seen some really great um things going out on social media for you know uh, domestic abuse victims for for um kids that don't have enough to eat all these social support things that are going around and um i just wanted to, i just want to have it be said that um those things are out there and um i know personally as a person who shares a lot on social media i have been collecting a lot of that kind of stuff and if anybody wants um a collection of those resources they should you know they can contact me or you know um yeah be in touch and, and if i had had my act together more i would have like um put up some screens of like resources because i think about that a lot people who aren't online as much as i am and they simply might not know and it's really scary to think of people getting cut off in unsafe environments you know environments that they don't have enough resources and food and all of that so um but they, they are out there. I've been, it's, I've been actually somewhat cheered by, more than somewhat cheered by the New Mexico response, both on an official government level and like the communities that are active here that I'm, that I'm like tied to. It's been, it's been good to see um, those yeah. relief networks starting to emerge. I mean, it's, there's no shortage of them. I don't know if they're going to be enough. It's partially a matter of outreach and getting to the people who need to see them and and then just all the logistical difficulties of our reality where you're really not supposed to be physically present with other people. I'd be mean, yeah. like, right. Well, and as much as a situation like this can show the cracks, right? Like there's no perfect system. I know there's a lot of critique out there right now about all of our shortcomings. And I, I accept and, and hold space for all of those uh, observations. Um, I'm not sure that we were going to end up in a, space that was going to be all that much better than where we are because if we're failing here now we might be failing you know in another way in another parallel universe um so as much as something like this shows kind of like the systemic faults obviously and like the amount of privilege that some of us have versus how little other of us have others of us have um i i do find a lot of comfort in just how quickly our community specifically shout out to albuquerque was able to really come to make uh, come together and make quick decisions for the benefit of others beyond just staying at home right so making sure that kids get food right i could probably live, yeah. list like five restaurants off the top of my head who are like oh no fuck it the kids get food i don't care yeah um, aps lunch APS cool. yeah aps you know urban java hot. joe's urban hot dog you know they've really made sure that there was like this as much as we can create a stop loss in exactly. that you know problem, it, we will um you know, and that that 
that bolsters my spirit, right? It makes me mm-hmm. feel like as much as I said, I accept the criticisms, I, I identify them, I don't disagree sure. with a lot of them. Um, but there are also good things to be seen, right? Like, how do we fill those cracks? Like, how do we shorten the gaps? How do we address those amongst us who are um, at, at, at real risk now, right? Above and beyond just getting sick, like, yeah. you know, in danger even. Like, how how are we dealing with those folks? And the fact that we even thought about it as quick as we did is, um, I don't know, it, it makes my spirit happy. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is opportunity in this, right? In, in thinking about, you know, it does provide, you know, this kind of almost cultural social reset of a little bit, yeah, giving us a moment to pause and sort of look around and 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 think about if this is who we want to be in two generations as a culture, as a society, as a as a body politic, as a socius, whatever. Is yeah. this who we want to be, or do we see, you know? in seeing the way that people are responding in wonderful, positive ways, that that's the, the groundswell that we build on coming out of it versus we're going to come back out of it, you know, even more hyper-polarized than we already were, right? There, there is a sort of fork in the road to some degree. And I'm not a uh, predictive science, so I don't make predictions, but it is a, it is the opportunity to kind of, you know, to, to it is an opportunity. To, yeah. to move. I'm too cynical to believe that anything much will change at all. Cause I just, I feel like I know people and I kind of know how we all work a little bit. Um, but here's to hoping, right? Like, again, if you can identify one or two things that in the future, if this happens again, we can just not have to worry about it because we solve that social problem. Like, I would be okay with one or two of these things being addressed, <laughs> if not all of them, obviously. Ryan, Ryan, what, <laughs> is, what does sociology have to say about, you know, online communities and building social networks online? Because that's where we are right now, and that's going to be the future for at least the next few weeks as like um, as a really big way we communicate. How yeah, does I, sociology I, overlap with that and like I think we you know we're we're lucky in that we we are in a technological space for those of us with access to it to be able to have these kinds of you know face to face somewhat personal interaction still with folks um, that that will allow us to do a lot of things that felt or that feel quote unquote normal, but also to do a lot of collective things. You know, we can, we can still organize in these kinds of rooms, right? We can still educate in these kinds of rooms. We can still, you know, have our social gatherings in these kinds of online, you know, video rooms. Um, you know, it's, it's making the jump from 140 characters or likes and retweets to something bigger than that that's going to help us maintain those communities right in the same way i i study uh, a lot of activism among uh marginalized communities and the online space is really really important in building and maintaining those networks uh but the change and the sort of real community building comes when you kind of take that next step so you know in the olden times we would talk about well when you get people to meetings or you get people to marches well now it's when we get people in, into these kind of video conversations yeah. um so i think the technology is is a benefit for us now you know where i may have been uh a little more skeptical about the utility of online social networking and community building in the past. I think now, because we we're all crashing Zoom servers, we're able to now kind of you know, we're able to do things we couldn't do before, right? And Absolutely. You know, just ten, even just ten years ago, we wouldn't have been able to have these kinds of things. And so it's to true. to be in that moment, I think is is beneficial for those of us with the again sort of the privilege to have stay at home jobs at this point. It's true. I have to throw in though, though, that um, device use and screen use, it's such an easy pill for anxiety. And it's going to be, you know, keeping all that balance where it just doesn't become your go-to drug. I mean, I'm feeling it hard. It's, I mean, who doesn't feel it already, you know, before all of this. And now um, the, the addiction factor to my phone and to my laptop is like, oh, it's real. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, and whatever I then I try to just um, for my work life, for instance, because it's obviously part of my work life, not just the addiction part, just the scrolling part. I do that as well. But then I suppose if I can use it as for as um, useful purposes in work life, I don't know. Yeah, and, and well, figuring out, anyway, you know, you know, we all need information, but at a certain point, you know, 
how much more of the same information do we need to keep gathering? I think we, we constantly, you know, we're seeking that source of the next piece of information. And at a certain point, that starts to become counterproductive, right? That was one of the, the questions someone asked uh, in, in my post earlier this week was, you know, I, I want to watch the news. I want to be responsible and know what's going on. But when, you know, is there a, a threshold point there where I need to just disconnect for my own, you know, mental health, my own well-being? <laughs> yes, to kind the of answer say is yes. <laughs> enough, enough news. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's hard, right? Because it is hard. It is such a rapidly changing thing, you know, day to day, hour to hour things are new. And so we want to kind of keep getting that refreshed, keep getting that memory, keep getting that information going. So. Yeah. But it is definitely a source of anxiety, right? This like sort of information overload, right? Like there's only so many words your brain can handle at a time. And if they're all terrible words with terrible associations, like it really does take a hit. Like your brain, your body does take a hit. And I know that around here, we've just absolutely made it a habit to just turn off news. We're news junkies. We're, we're, political aficionados we like keep track of all the fun things and all the not so fun things but um you know we find ourselves just at some point being like saturated and that's the point where it's like okie dokie it's time to either watch something else or turn everything off and just do something else because yeah, absolutely something physical there's, there's only there's only so much you can take right and words do affect us right like the way that words are ordered in a sentence and what their meanings are like have can have like incredibly deep impact on us and we don't even notice because we are of an age where we take so much in constantly like my information input is like through the roof it's it's oh, dumb right. how many headlines i read a day i i couldn't even tell you i don't even know how many it is well it's i mean long. the first couple of weeks of all this i i made myself dig into all this YouTube and uh, you know online publishing stuff that was like really wonky and took a lot of attention so that I would not watch the news. Like I did yeah. not be here anymore. I knew what was going on. New hobby for you. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it, it the more that I could just focus on something else. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm continuing to try to do that. Um, I, so I wanted, this was originally set to end at one, but let's go about like 10, 15 minutes over just because of the problems Good. we had before. Yeah, so sure. That out. But I wanted to ask everybody, like, um, one, uh, like if we, we could work towards some positive things, like to wrap this as we leave this conversation, like what are some of the communities that, that are now mostly online understood, but what are, you know, what, what are the, what are the, the communities that you're involved with that are helping get you through this stuff and how do you think we all can help or help ourselves by like continuing to engage with those communities? How are you doing it? Well, I'm going to go ahead and start off with a shameless plug. Um, <laughs> but if you're not already part of the Coffee and Creatives community on Facebook, uh, feel free to join us. Uh, we are a work group for creatives to help um, figure out problems, obstacles, challenges in your creative practice um and i have I've, I've been part of the group now since july of 2017 um and and it's a very active community i've had to take like a moment and like a step back because it can be very overwhelming um but i know my 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 peeps are there. Yeah, we, we're pushing like 3,000 members on the Facebook group now. Can it's I crazy. ask whoever has back, background uh, kitchen stuff to mute? I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, if you're a creative of any sort, if you count yourself as a, um, I don't know, whatever, artist, musician, uh, wordsmith, um, you can definitely come to the group. And I've really been bolstered by how everybody stepped up and started providing other resources right and sharing resources with each other well you guys um, were already an online group which is cool i mean that so th there's yeah. no there's no translation or like bird you know difficulty of going online because you guys were really uh, online yeah we had traction we've definitely pivoted a little bit i think everybody has just realized that you know the artist next to you may not be as well off as you how are we going to help that person and mm. um you know, there's there's something that happens to your brain and your body when you help somebody, right? Something positive happens to you when you help something positive happen to somebody else. Um, and I'm seeing that a lot right now. So go coffee and creatives. <laughs> so the art, arts community for you, are there any other like, um, I don't know, are you already are connected with, with other, like either, I don't know, parent groups at school or like what are the, what are the networks that you're still keeping alive? 
or or are you is that is that the main one um the band family at my kids school we're all pretty pretty well gelled together um nice. so i'm part of the band boosters and um you know people with kids man <laughs> we're going through our own set of things right now well, um i partially ask that because like i'm the parent who i always feel like i don't reach out enough to other parents of my kids like to get them together um yeah. And I'm familiar with that today, feeling. I changed that. I'm like, I need to, st you know, like I sent an email to a bunch saying, hey, could your kid Zoom with Jazzy? Because he's yeah. me. And, you know, now it's like pushing me into just being more intentional and not blowing it off. Yeah. And the thing that falls to the side a lot. And anyway, so I'm not really connected with other parents, but I'm trying to like make a point to be right now. And I think that's probably good practice. Like I said, we have a lot in common. If we have kids during this whole thing, like, we have like the normal worries and then we have this other set of fat layer of worries, right? Where it's like, oh, holy shit. Like, I don't know, it's my kid's senior year next year and APS just canceled school for the rest of this year. So what does that look for him? Like, what is his senior year gonna look like? We have all of these, you know, social sort of structures around senior year and what a magical time and all of this special shit happens and stuff and it's like, what is my seat? What's my kid's senior yeah. year going to look like post pandemic? I have no idea. Is he going to graduate on time? I don't know. Exactly. Is it my fault? Probably not. But still, it's a concern, you know. My daughter just came in as right before we went live, and she's like, "Mom, they just announced." And I knew they were going to from yesterday. Mm. The word was yeah. on the street that they were going to cancel for the rest of the year. Right. Um, I mean, okay. Stupid question, Ryan. It, schools <laughs> are they considered a sociological <laughs> institution? Uh, yeah, very much so. I mean, we, we, we only public have public schools yeah. because we wanted to get kids out of factories, essentially. I mean, they, right. they were built as a, as, a, as a response to a social problem, not an individual problem. So absolutely. And, and we're, going to, we're all going to have to sort of reform what we think education is, what we think a school is, what a grade is, what an assignment is. You know, yeah. we're, there, there's a lot of push among academics right now to kind of rethinking do we need tests? Do we need grades? Do we need any of these things? What are we actually trying to accomplish? And then how do we assess those accomplishments? And I think mm -hmm. everyone at every level is, is trying to figure that out now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most parents that I know for the last two weeks have been um, smartly like keeping the bar low, keeping mm -hmm. everybody cool. We're right. all adjusting. You know, and that's a great short term strategy. But what about this long term? Like, what do yeah. I do now? Like, am I supposed to crack open my calculus book and teach my that's kid? Because damn, y'all, I don't know if I remember it that well. Right. Like, yeah. And that, you know? that's the burden that shouldn't be on you, right? That the schools are the schools will have to step into that breach somehow. They just they are not they equipped to do it yet. No, they're not. And again, it's like it's a matter of access, right? So like mm -hmm. in order for students to attend school, we've created a whole bus system. They're yellow, they're special, they're very important. But you know, we don't consider internet to be a utility. So mm -hmm. what kind of expectation do we have of people? And and how head on are we going to address these issues of equity amongst young people? Or are we just gonna throw everybody back in a factory? Like what are our options here? Right. And and realistically what do we want to accomplish so that we do our best by our kids like that yeah. to me is is a huge piece that i'm i'm just and and i i know that we're working on it ryan i get yeah. it but like damn y'all yeah. like we're a bit behind the ball on this one you know yeah uh, from from k through uh where i am yes every everyone is <laughs> trying to I, I trying to figure it out, out. My kids' teachers so far have been great and sending stuff in email and like we've been back and forth and you know sending a writing uh, the Jasper did a writing challenge and he's sharing it. So these embryonic like baby steps towards developing some sort of online system to do this are there and I'm <laughs> thankful for them. But yeah, there's a lot, there's a there's a long ways to go. There's a lot of ground to cover. Yeah. And we gotta I do wanna, right by our kids, you know. I wanna try to figure out how to articulate an issue let's see um you know prior to the pandemic uh institutions like public schools their histories are really tied to their locality and they're not the same um but one of the things that public schools have done is kind of uh closed doors they've they, politically they've figured out how to slow down input coming from outside and 
and focus that inside their own administration. I'm thinking of APS in particular. It's it's a strategy for, in my opinion, uh, that is a strategy that the schools have been using to protect themselves from uh, destructive elements in our wider government. You know, like APS as as an example has figured out how to keep opinions out so that it can function. Um, but now here we are at pen, in pandemic land, and uh, those same non-porous borders all of a sudden dump all the, the needed change on people like Ryan. They, we go back and say, the institution goes to you and says, guess what? You know, you get to make up this whole, cr good luck. And, right. and parents like you and me, Ruth, turn to Ryan and go like, you know, well, what are we going to do with senior year? Well, no. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. What we're looking yeah. at is what we're, we're, what we're seeing is this, that the institution, it needs to, the institution needs to change. And the, we need to, in other words, like increase access. Like that's a dialogue that's been going on for decades, you know? Yeah. Like, oh yeah. So we're, yeah. I'm and institutions hate happened. to change. Yeah. Right. They and do. institutions they have do. to protect themselves from, from people like agitators like us who want that change to happen and you know and lickety split um so i think there's a question in there how do we <laughs> help our institutions become more nimble and flexible despite uh decades or even centuries of developing you know thick skins and slow uh cultural bodies basically yeah uh, that's a question right that's that's a great question that I don't have an easy answer to. Uh, because you got a long one? Uh, well, I don't even know if I have a long one. But, you know, okay. but inst you know, institutions are built to be inert. You know, yeah. In essence, they're built to sort of here's the design, they function, and then we just let them function. Yeah, and, like the light uh, switch, right? Right, yeah. and and that and they are usually designed to be very efficient, very effective, very useful things over time they become less efficient less effective less useful but they don't have you know as you're saying the nimble is a great word here right institutions are never nimble uh, institutions institutions are, don't play badminton they're glacial they right they're not nimble they're they're glacial they move yeah. at very slow paces right uh while everything changes around them they continue to lag as as cultural things go and so mm. you know that may be a matter of of redesign for a lot of these things you know we've been talking a lot in the sociology of education about how you know we don't need to teach information to our students anymore but we have a system that's built around teaching information right? Right. all of the information in the world is in your pocket so you don't ever need to remember anything but we're still in a model where that's yeah. how we teach right we teach well, you to a test it's convenient so, because that means that we don't have to dismantle power structures that means we don't have to course, think about higher course. budgets we don't have to right. think about all these things that people like to concentrate for themselves money and power um yep. <laughs> to control the conversation right so it's like oh well if you just keep teaching the information like they'll just be perfect like i was when i was in grad school 20 years ago or whatever right. when in Me fact too. <laughs> But in fact, what we need to do is stop teaching information and start teaching like a dismantlement, right? Like how do we take things Critical apart thinking, yes. and then put them back together in a more um, equitable way, right? In, right. A, in a more just way, in a way yeah, that no, creates no, we, more access. Been, yeah, we've been teaching authority and, and we've not been teaching creative critical thinking and that's right. that's what we need right now is creative critical thinking well and i think you mentioned it earlier ryan this could be a great reset i mean there are there are a number of positive things that could come out of this like while of we course. all stop and have to think about making so many decisions that previously just kind of happened being more intentional about the right. pieces of culture what one of those things i just want to throw out there is science like it, let's imagine six nine 18 months from now let's say a vaccine comes out like we're past this science becomes the hero again science <laughs> is proven to matter i'm i'm focusing on the positive here i'm fantasizing um, i'm so a scientist matter, i'm all for it so. feel, yeah right or and i also was thinking about that when i was reading about there's some reports like the the air in los angeles is so clean and and i'm not talking about the dolphins and the italian <laughs> But, but Look, Italy needs all the, all the positive it can get right now. So. But there are some, 
I think measurable um, improvements in like pollution and stuff like right now. And could this be a little bit of the answer to the question that everybody has had? Like, well, I think there's a certain amount of reluctance or, or um, uh, pushback against climate change action in some people and in some institutions because it might not be a belief that it will matter that you'll do all this massive changes and it won't really matter. And wouldn't it be cool if we saw like, geez, a global shutdown of most, you know, of certain industries of a lot of industries actually had an impact. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that be cool? We'll see. I think. Oh, yeah, I'm with you on that. That would be incredible. Yeah. And, and, that. And, and a rejuvenation of, of, of respect for science. I mean, it is going to be scientists that help us out of this right now. Or, or it already and, is. Well, and people I mean, who believe in science, <laughs> policymakers right. who believe in scientists. It's just the scientists and the people who are, you know, making decisions based on it as opposed yeah. to, you know, thoughts and prayers. And stuff like thoughts right. and prayers. Thoughts yeah. And prayer. Thoughts and prayers yeah. are great. We love thoughts and prayers. Are there so, any, are, yeah. Well, I was just thinking I, on my on our walk last night. I was thinking about that kind of thing where it's like, well, what if what if we took away from this the idea that you know, maybe once a year everybody buys their groceries ahead of time and we just shut ourselves in for a couple of weeks right like i and i was just kind of thinking about that and it made me think back to so i'm from mexico originally and um mexico city the capital of the country um uh, is insanely populated it's, it's it's very dense um and there used to be like super huge pollution problems there and something that they instituted was um a schedule for cars Right. So if your license plate looks a certain way, there's one day out of the week where you're not allowed to drive. Like that's it. Right. So if you have a blue license plate, you don't drive on Thursdays. Right. If you have a pink license plate, you don't drive on Mondays, whatever. Um, and wow. just like that marginal change for a short amount of time. And I'm not sure what it is now. And I've been in the U.S. for a long time. This happened during the 80s. Um, like that's a, that's a tiny thing to ask of people, right? And they enforced it. It was a legal thing. Like you would get Is a there ticket. Is there a lot of pushback? Were, were people freaking out? I mean, I was a little kid, so I'm not too clear on the whole picture. Um, but basically you would just get tickets. It ended up being a punitive thing, right? So if you were driving on Thursdays with your blue license plate, then you had to pay the government X amount of dollar or well, whatever, not dollars, but monies, you know. Um, and, you know, Mexico City, the air is a lot cleaner now. It, it took like a little bit of sacrifice and a little bit of creative thinking, but, you know, removing a fifth of the cars or a seventh of the cars total for, you know, one day at a time um, created the sort of uh, incremental change for the better. And I think it also kind of expanded people's idea of what they could or couldn't do on their own, right? Yes. To, to make yes. things happen, to change things. So, yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, I... Culturally what, or societally, what can we do? This is... This is teaching us, this is giving us a whole bunch of new data on something we've never tried before with these shutdowns and with everything, closing the schools, blah, blah, blah. Not that anybody wanted to do it, but here we are doing it. And it's gonna inform us on what we can do and what the effects will be. You know, yeah. I, I hope, you know, unless the politicians like in this country insist that we pack the churches on Easter. I mean, like what, you know, some people believe that that's the right thing to do. And again, that gets back to that siloing. You know, I, I have a definite a silo view because of the interactions that I have with people in my life and, and online. And also being a self-employed person for 20 some years, like my group of people is very intentional. I don't have like people in my workplace you know, like just that, that I have been forced to be. You need around. to increase the number of assholes in your life. That's what it is. <laughs> it no. Very, it, it would, it would open up my, it would open up my perspective, honestly. But, yeah. um, Wait, but anyway. Uh, this, this, I've heard two things now that I think would be great moments to be asking artists in general. Yes. So one is um, how, like artists come up with an event in which humans will want to get together who are from different silos and, and it's going to be fun because that, that would be an argument about why they would want to come together. Totally. Um, and the other one was that thing about the license plates, like, cool. So let's ask American artists, like, what can we do as an entire country that would be interesting enough to actually get people to want to do it and, um, and somehow makes a positive change. Like we, we obviously you probably want to, 
if I'm starting to solve that problem, I would think, well, everybody's already in Zoom calls, so let's do something with cool Zoom calls that's interesting. Yeah. But I, I hope that as I figure we're kind of going out pretty soon. We're right, we're about there. What do you mean? As, as humans, like humans are going <laughs> No. <Bye. laughs> no, as in this particular podcast. <laughs> Hear me. I figure yeah. we're all <laughs> yeah, I, I we're think your opinion strongly. <laughs> <laughs> so that that would be my my shout out my question to Albuquerque artists is um you know let's sort of do like a call for entries like let's uh let's have an interesting exhibit of like you know the license plate idea yeah just actually that was a beautiful idea like seeing all the license plates in different colors like I, I can imagine yeah so um, there you go that's my it's my send out do you do you um I wanted to ask just a couple have have any of you been looking at the the YouTube stream. A no. couple people no. have been putting questions there. Do you mind? Can we take a couple extra minutes? I've been yeah, like, let's do it. Yeah. Um, I appreciate okay. that. Um, um, Kelsey Kellner has asked Ryan if you could comment about the effects of shutting down public schooling, which we talked about a little bit. So maybe she had put that question before we did. Yeah. Um, and and but she goes on to or no, it's a different person. There's a couple people who actually asked about suicide and and addiction and um, how we think that. Um, you know that, that might play out and we did talk about that a little bit and i think we all expressed some worry about that and um i don't exactly know um i had mentioned that i know there are resources and again at least in my albuquerque community it's been great to see um outreach and messaging and actual resources being put out there and um, next time i do this show i'm gonna like get them on a screen and like put them up on the screen and try to share yeah. that stuff and i can always do that after the fact too with this um with this video when i put it uh, the the archive version up on youtube but anyway um other than you know other than what's already out there and it's being spread on social media what other ways can people avail themselves of the resources and 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 deal with Deal with a be you know having addictions and um, mental health issues when isolated. Do you know? Actually, Andrew, I should ask you. Do you know about online counseling and stuff like that? Are there are are there free or affordable ways to get help? So the, the terrible help. answer is I don't know because I haven't done any research. But yeah. I can say in general. Uh, or maybe in specific, there's a thing, e-therapy. You can like type in etherapy.com. Okay. Or just look for online therapy. And and as of the past few years, those kinds of businesses have just exploded. Um, in part because the whole counseling or the whole psychological professions in general started to agree that you could be ethical and do it. Um, which actually was a really complicated questions to answer. Yeah. Both technically and uh and within the profession. I know. So there, there are lots of resources. Are they free though? I don't know about that. Yeah. I, I, so if I'm thinking like, how would we find out? Call UNMH. Yeah. Um, what, and they'll what, be able to tell you. What mental health uh, has ever fallen under like the public health umbrella? You know, like, I don't That's know what, at all. That is a great question. So how does mental health and public health interact and what's the history of that going back Look into that next time. <laughs> i don't know it's like, it seems like it should, there should be a public health component of that right right we got to find some really smart people to come talk about that because well know, not which anything. actually would, would, i could do that that could be Let's i could that. go find those folks yeah. <laughs> absolutely um again in general like i think what the first thing to come to mind is the broken system stuff yeah um that what we're experiencing is the result of depriving mental health um, and anything that is not purely rational and purely physical, we've been depriving that the world of those kinds of treatments of resources of all kinds for decades. Right. So that's where we're at. Um, there is in, no system. In New Mexico, I mean, the system is too weak to, it, to uh, work in this difficult situation. It's like not- Yeah. And that's been true in mental health in Albuquerque, again, for a long time. Yeah. Uh, do you remember 2013 when yes. Tejana Susana uh, yes. like, just figured out how to kill mental health in our town? I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit. 
there was a um, terrible, terrible thing that happened that is like so yeah. like it, it, it's really permanently changed things here. And yes. I see improvements happening now, but wow, that was that was so bad. And even just on a business aspect, that these these businesses were absolutely shut down. Yes, it was all really um, corrupt and bad. It and was so, corrupt, yeah. and, and so as I was saying with you, Ruth, too, um, these issues about access and uh, consolidating control in ways that really only benefit the medical business and don't benefit the people who need the services. These have been going on for decades, you know, so honestly, my entire life. Yeah. So, um, so like, you know, if we wanted to, when we're looking at the history of how mental health has been a part of public health here in specific, like that's a big part of history is a history of um, not delivering services that really useful to people who really need it. So that being said, uh, if a person is part of either a public school or UNM as an institution or CM as an institution, many, many said using their, many folks who are in need have been using a relationship with a college to get funding for their life so they can survive. Right. So, you know, and, but along with that, uh, if one is a CNM student, one can get free counseling through CNM. So very likely you could call CNM and they'd have some kind of online version that, of e-therapy that they can do. And the same will be true for a UNM. I'm going to make um, a point before the next time I do this to reach out to the people I know and find out about mental health resources, like especially, you know, delivered online. And it's funny that I haven't, that there, out of all the great things that I've seen go out in the last couple of weeks, I have not seen that. I don't know what's, what's out there. And that seems right. like an obvious value. Yeah. And importance. So yeah. I'm going to look I it up. I wish I was that person. <laughs> I'm going to look it up. Well, it's fine. Um, we have all had a lot, I mean, we all have the perspectives we have, and I really appreciate everything that you do have to offer. And then it's fun to think about the questions that we don't know the answers to. And there's so many right now that it's like just kind of overwhelming. It's all this new territory and um, yeah, it's crazy. So we all just need to keep breathing and doing what we can and share can it. I shout out one more thing before we go. Um, yeah, 100%. Just in terms of uh, other communities and other ways to support folks, um, you know, the, as a working musician in Perry, you know this, everything is dark. Everyone is, you know, yes. every venue is shut down. Every sound guy is out of work. Every security person is out of work. Every band can't make money uh, at, at the moment since we make all our money at shows yep. these days. Uh, so if you, you know, love your local music scene and love those bands, uh, you know, put their stuff on streaming, buy their t-shirts you know when when we get those shows rescheduled uh i don't ever want to hear someone tell me that they can't come to a show again <laughs> because we are right. all dying to be on those stages and dying to see you there so no kidding. Uh, you know that's a community that is just sitting and waiting right now because there's just nothing we can do um, and so whatever whatever couple of bucks you have or or streaming device you can just play in the background we don't make much off of it but we make something yeah and it's better than not. Can I say one thing to that too? I'm glad uh, you okay. added that. You know, how it, I found it really difficult to realize that I, I am not essential. That like from the perspective of like physical distancing and all that, all of us, whatever art form we're in, are not essential. So I just want to say to all of us that we are. We are completely essential. Like I, I, I get it. I was just going to say like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our consumption it, but, of art has gone up exponentially in the last few weeks exactly. everybody's yeah. not just mine not just yours everybody's so yeah yes. the next time yeah. somebody tells me that the arts this that or the other fish posh i'm like right. whatever you watched all of netflix so right you stand correct <laughs> right talk to me when you watched all of netflix yeah i got really angry i saw a tweet from nikki haley about um uh you know our former whatever our for trump trump sycophant she posted something on twitter like Look at all, you know, in this coronavirus, coronavirus relief bill, all these millions of dollars are going to the, you know, NEA and Institute for Humanity, all this stuff, as if, it, and she was just like, can you imagine how many people could be helped by that? It's just like, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, like, people are helped by that all the fucking mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Like, you know, just, 
it, that that tweet made me angry. Yeah. I needed to get that out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really cool. um, Thank you, Perry. But and I'm glad that Ryan mentioned that about the bands. I actually wanted to let fans know, and I already have online. But if anybody wants to send us a video, and it need, it's important that there's not be any other copyright claims to that mm -hmm. music or video. But we've been doing a thing like Eva has a show called the Cancelled Shows, where she's um, oh, it's fab. I love it. It's really fun. And then also I was thinking, even if it was just a video that, um, again, if you own it, we'll put up on our YouTube page and we can put links down. I mean, if it helps get the word out about your band, I would love that because it's, it's content and I would like to craft that content. I've been like really tinkering with these ways to make content that helps forward some sort of a cause, whether it's right. supporting a band, which whatever bands causes, right. Or an actual like nonprofit or whatever. Um, I want to do stuff like that. And Go honestly, Harwood. sending me a video, that's easy. I mean, that's, that's, I can do that with my eyes closed. Unlike, you know, getting that live stream to always work. Um, so <laughs> bands out there, just get in touch with me through Pyrograph and we'd love to put your video or, it could be a live, it could not, not so much a live stream, but it could be, um, it could be kind of whatever you want it to be. And then just give me the links and we'll try to get the word out about your thing. And that's, that's the same for performers and also like, um, arts hub is having a, a, a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. So, um, we talked about them on the live stream the other day and any ways that, that I can help spread the word. I'm trying to like use this channel for that as much as possible. Sounds so. great. Awesome. Well, um, I guess with that, I just say thank you for joining me and thank you for dealing with my technical um, issues. And if you All guys good. Are down to come to, back again. I mean, we did yes. go live. We're live now. We're going to say goodbye, but, but we eventually right. figured it out and it was fun. It was fun to see that. It was fun. Stuff was going in. Nice chatting with you all. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you to Ayana Freeman for uh, responding to my question. I just want to say that we didn't have time to address what you talked about, but yeah, thank you. Ayana, shout out. We're going to have to her. Let's yeah, we'll do more. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. This is Pyrograph live and um, I guess I'll just sign off here. All right. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye. Okay. I'm going to you do? stop. Stop. Okay, that right. should stop the stream and then I guess Andrew is probably gone, but thank you guys. And I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Perry. Three at the beginning. Oh, but no, that was good. That was awesome. Thanks, Perry. Okay. Appreciate that it. Was nice meeting you, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, you too. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Bye, that was amazing. Andrew. Yeah, that yeah was thanks, great. guys. Bye, Ruth. Cheers. Bye. Yeah. Looking forward to next time. <laughs>